Good afternoon, everybody on the East Coast, and good morning to all my fellow West Coasters. I'm, this is Ryan Thurman with Contact Center Compliance. I've got David Van Everen from 5.9 on the phone. You say hello to everybody, David. Hi, everyone. And, and we're going to have Joe Stanscran joining us here momentarily. He's with the law offices of Joe Stanscran back east. He's also our corporate counsel for compliance guide and for our updates. And going to provide us some of the overviews here today. I'm going to kind of kick things off while we're waiting for Joe. Um, as far as the presentation today, we're going to be on here for about an hour, mostly talking about some of the new changes that's coming from the FCC and some of the updates from the compliance world as far as enforcement trends, you know, who's getting fined, what you need to worry about, and how you can kind of stay out of trouble and really leading into uh, some of the things this fall that, and next year that's coming out. I appreciate David joining us and uh, people from uh, not just the U.S., but uh, the rest of the world. We've got about, uh, I think, 300 or so, 317 people that, that, that signed up for the webinar. Got a little over 100 folks on the line here. As we go, you're probably going to run into some questions and have something maybe you want answered. Feel free to put that into GoToMeeting. They have a text kind of chat environment that you can send us a message, and we'll either answer them as we go along, or at the end we're going to have a little more time for some Q&A. We probably won't do a live Q&A just because we're kind of stretched for time. We do. Um, we are recording the webinar so that we'll have access if you miss something, want to review it, share it with other people. And we'll post that on our website on dnc.com underneath our resources. And I'll, I'll send out a link afterwards. We'll also have the slides available for people. So there is our contact information. This will be on the slide. Um, a little, some highlights um, from the agenda today. Talk a little bit about the uh, kind of stated do not call, where are we, 2012. The you know, list has been out for quite some time. But the national level, uh, what's going on in the wireless rules, what the world, why the FCC rules could be a, a big game changer, what people might want to do to, to plan for that in advance. Uh, talk a little bit about the different changes to pre-recorded predictive dialing, preview dialing, automated opt-out, um, inbound calling. Yes, there's rules you need to worry about, so we'll go through what, what those are. And hey, we're going to talk a little bit. This is Joe. Hey, Joe. Thanks for joining us. I knew I, I knew we could count on you some, some, at some point to, to jump get on in here. here eventually, yeah. Yep. We've got David on as well. And uh, just going through the quick agenda, and I'm going to go through the uh, kind of state of the union with the DNC. And, and then we'll get you in there for the FCC role. All right, great. So the first issue we're going to talk about is the national do not call list and kind of you know where we are today. I just pulled these numbers uh, off of our updates that we get from the National Registry yesterday. And the FTC list has actually been growing continuously. There's a very small percentage of numbers that are actually removed for being disconnected that we find. We're up to 207 million numbers that are on the registry. Um, that the national do not call list is, is composed of landline numbers, cell phone numbers. You've got a lot of business numbers that have shown up on there. It really shouldn't be there, but that's where we are. Um, in in the world of phone numbers, um, you're probably going to see. You know, I've I've seen lists that are scrubbed that. You know, you end up with 10 or 20 percent of the list that is callable after you do a scrub nowadays. So it takes a lot of data, especially if you don't have a business relationship, to end up with a callable list. It, it's incredible. Some of the, the rates of data loss uh, are really seem like they've been re being reduced. Um, in the world of the states, you still got 13 states that hold on to their do not call program, they hold on to their state rules, and they do enforce them. I spoke to uh, Brenda Headley the other day over in Louisiana, um, trying to get some clarification on some of their state holidays coming up. And I asked her, you know, do you guys enforce these state holidays? And they do. If they get complaints, they will go after a company for calling on one of their goofy state holidays. And they still have their state list, and she reminded me that everybody needs to buy their state list, which is kind of one, they're one of the unique ones. But 
Um, then you get other issues that, that come out on top of the national DNC besides the states. You get the issue of ported cell phone numbers versus uh, doing your scrubbing for carrier numbers. It's not a simple equation when you need to go out there and, and perform a cell phone scrub. And you've actually, I've actually seen that list that comes from Newstar, which are the ported numbers that you need to purge out for predictive dialer calls or manual calls of five states grow um, a little bit in the last, um, even the last time we did our webinar, I think it's, we did about a month ago, and it grew, this list grew by about 100,000 people. What they mean by ported is those are numbers that have come over from a landline number. So you can essentially take your home phone, turn it into your cell phone number. About half of that list uh, shows up on the national do not call list, but it does require some um, licensing through us to get it to set up the scrub and it's, it's just kind of a trend that's increasing. Um, FTC has been getting a lot of complaints, this was from their data book, about pre-recorded calls. They're getting um, together this fall and they're having a robocall summit in Washington, D.C. And they're talking about ways to uh, police that a little bit more. Myself, I got a pre-recorded sales call on my cell phone the other day um, with a spoof caller ID happened to me uh, a couple weeks ago at home. I mean, there's, I think, some of these uh, pre-reported companies that are out there see the end is near with the FCC, FTC rules, and they're kind of putting the last gas to it. So we're getting calls from people here that are still running pre-recorded, but they want to be safe because they don't want to be roped into that. So I would definitely encourage that. Um, what we're going to do right now is just take a quick uh, poll and get an idea of um, what kind of uh, dialers people are using, just so we can kind of gauge what we need to cover and if we need to spend um, time um, on uh, some of the pre-recorded rules versus preview dialers. So I'm going to launch the poll. All you need to do is click a couple buttons on there, and you can uh, answer our little poll and we get an idea if you're using uh, manual calls, predictive dialer, or preview. Learn this from a couple webinars. A lot of people are doing SMS, so I want to lump that in there. And uh, you know, a little less kind of amount of people. What the uh, results are of this poll. Yeah, so give people another couple seconds to fill this out. We can play some music in the background, that'd be a good idea. Yeah, I should have brought my guitar in today. <laughs> Could have played the Bonanza theme. <laughs> I'm thinking uh, Jeopardy. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, so oh, let's, let's go through the results. We've got 55% manual calls, 50% predictive dialer, 23% preview dialer, 22% pre-recorded auto dialer, what some people call robocalls, and 17% SMS or text. Let me close the poll. What percent uh, preview? Uh, it was like 20%. Oh, how about that? OK. Uh, 23%. And last, that last question of what, uh, that we're going to do is uh, just to get an idea of the audience. Uh, which platform are you on? Are you using 5.9? I would imagine we're going to get a few people that are using that. Are they using interactive? Other, connect first, another hosted dialer. What are people using today on their, their on their technology to deliver calls? A lot of people are going to the cloud. Certainly been a, a huge buzz over here in the Bay Area. We were cloud before it was cool. I think five nine was too. So, so we got uh, thirteen percent five nine, twelve percent Noble, six percent i three, sixty five percent other. Huh. Figure out who those others. All right. So let's jump over to some of the FTC data. Um, and and what, what this chart shows is basically the number of companies that are buying a full national DNC license or a SAN number. You can see back in 06, everybody was buying SAN numbers. A lot more companies involved in telemarketing. List goes up. Cost goes up and availability data goes down. 
and you end up with you know three thousand people roughly that are are buying national DNC licenses. That to me is surprising. Um, certainly with the wireless rules coming out, we might see some changes there. Um, but it's it's uh, it's not the same universe we used to be in. Let's talk a little bit about why it's so important to try to get consent before the FCC rules come down when calling a, a cell phone number. So next year, sometime out in the future, when the Office of Management Budget enacts the new TCPA rules, you're not going to be able to call a cell phone number unless you've got written permission from the consumer. Currently, people kind of will, this is for predictive or automated dialing calls. And currently, that really is an issue because the tr there's a couple trends going on that you can see on the chart over here. One is the number of wireless households where they don't have a landline is on the increase. And the landline with wireless is coming down. So this is one of those neat infographics that people love to throw on LinkedIn. I found this somewhere else. But um, you know, what percentage you know have ethnic groups have wireless only? There's some stats there you can take back to your marketing department. Um, you can look at the age groups there, which is kind of interesting, and then uh, gender selection. And you also see um, like the article I got this from points to some of the states that are leading with wireless only households. Surprisingly, they're uh, some of your lower income states. Arkansas, Mississippi, Texas is up there, North Dakota, Idaho, Kentucky. Uh, the lowest rates of wireless only households are Rhode Island, New Jersey, Connecticut, and New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Mass. Uh, renters and younger households also tend to be more likely to be wireless only households. So it's some uh, interesting trends, but the, the reality is that more people very, are very have interesting. Uh, these are incredible statistics. I'm uh, just really interesting to see how uh, the wireless uh, uh, is being used across the United States, and you know it just makes sense that uh, I guess uh, lower income people would opt uh, for wireless. Uh, maybe they move to a uh, to a new place or they're renting a place. Why bother putting in a landline that's just more money? So very, very interesting stuff here. And I know like in the collections world, um, it, the, the restrictions, the way they're handled where a lot of collections companies will still scrub cell phone numbers because they don't, not sure if they've got consent and they don't want to get sued, it just kills lists because, you know, they're trying to, you can't chase people on landline. You know, everybody's using a cell phone. So. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what you need to have uh, to uh, – actually, let's do another quick poll, and I promise this will be the last one, because this one was interesting last time. And the, the question is, is um, what the current fine is for calling a cell phone number using a dialer. How much is the FCC going to hit you with if you call a cell phone number um, with the dialer without the proper kind of consent? Let's see if people either watch the last webinar or are just incredibly <laughs> on their toes. So we've got some smarty pants in the group, as I expected. Uh, give people a couple minutes. All right. We're going to cut you guys off now. The answer is it's the biggest number on there. Yeah, it's the big number on there, 16,000. Um, that's per violation. Now they right. can stack those violations, right, Joe? So they, you know, they certainly can. And and for any anyone in the uh, in the legal space uh, representing uh, companies that are being investigated by the FCC and the FTC, you you very rapidly learn that sixteen thousand times any number becomes a big number, uh, especially if you're dealing with uh, telephone calls. Uh, people make a lot a lot of telephone calls. And then they get your bill right out after the after everything else to uh, defend themselves, right? Well, well it, it actually is very helpful. They take a look at the uh, potential fine with the FTC, and they look at my bill like, oh well, that's not that's not that much, right? So we'll we'll move on here to uh, this is just a quick uh, synopsis what you need to do to achieve safe harbor. I get these calls all day. Uh, not all day, but I would say four or five people a day call me now. Tell me they need everything so they can be qualified for safe harbor. 
That's not such an easy question I would say to answer or to solve for. Um, there are certainly things you can do, like hiring a company like Contact Center Compliance or using a, a dialer like 5.9 that's got a lot of embedded compliance technology or integrations with us. Um, there's a lot of other things that you got to do internal, um, policies, procedures, training, um, and, and the burden of proof is really on the company to provide, right, Joe, in the event of investigation. I mean, you really have the, the way have the way I like to put it is, um, if you are under investigation, you want to be able to tell a good story, and you want to be able to quickly tell that story. And I fully understand, you know, um, that it's a, a complex process to uh, take a step back and put together everything that's listed here, just to make sure that you're qualifying for safe harbor. The key thing is having the policies and procedures in place and that you're tracking everything and that people are signing off on the policies and procedures. Um, and yes, it takes time. It can take uh, months in order to get that done. But once you're on the other side, it just becomes a matter of updating information as appropriate. And it's well worth it because in the event you get investigated, you're able to say, well, look, we have all these wonderful compliance procedures and policies in place. Um, and of course, you know, uh, uh, mistakes will happen, but you don't need to go after us. And, and there's some real, let me go back up to this other page here, there's some real easy ways the FTC and FCC looks for companies that are out of compliance, and that's around the update period. So if they get complaints, uh, you know, that are 60 days past when a number was put onto the DNC list, they can tell that a company basically loaded a list in their dialer and just didn't rescrub it. And the FCC rules are actually a little tighter. They only they require a 15-day update period. And because the, the portability list essentially is updated daily, you essentially, if you're using a dialer, need to scrub your list at least every 15 days to qualify for Safe Harbor, maybe a little sooner just so you can trim off the uh, any potential um, issues that may come arise. Let's jump over to the new FCC rules, and I'm going to hand the mic or the my headset, my virtual <laughs> headset, over to Joe, and we're going to hear from oh, him. Thank you very much. And then we'll, we'll thank hear you, from Ryan, David. Thank you, everyone. For, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say. Then we'll, we'll hear from David, kind of midway stream, and then we'll wrap it up with uh, some questions. If you're just joining us, we are going to have the slides. So every, all the 1,500 people that asked me that, we'll have the slides for you. Don't worry, Joe. Um, All right, great. <laughs> and uh, we'll go from there. All right, great. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. Um, <clears throat> to, get to talk about the FCC report and order <clears throat> that came out earlier uh, this year, I just want to briefly take a look at the background. Um, you know, how is it that we got to a point where the FCC felt it necessary to issue that report and order? Um, the, the starting point is 2008, when the Federal Trade Commission changed its pre-recorded rules. And I think everybody remembers that day. Um, from, from that point forward, under the FTC rules, if you are sending off pre-recorded telemarketing messages, you have to get express written consent. And that impacted lots and lots of people uh, in the industry. Uh, of course, there are some people that um, aren't covered uh, by the Federal Trade Commission rules, but they are covered by the Federal Communication Rules, Communication Commission rules. Um, and for those entities, they didn't, uh, they weren't covered by this new rule requiring ex requiring express written consent. Also included in the uh, the FCC rule, uh, you have to have an opt out uh, via, uh, via an automated key press or voice activated mechanism where you opt out of uh, receiving future phone calls. And a key thing between the FTC and the FCC, and, and I, I'm asked this question all the time, you know, why can't the FTC and the FCC get together and come up with one standard rule? Well, the reason is uh, the underlying uh, legal statute that gives the FTC and the FCC the authority to enact these rules in the first place. The FTC's underlying uh, statutory language is technology agnostic. It doesn't matter how you make the call. It, it doesn't matter if the call is to a landline or to a wireless line. Um, the FCC, <clears throat> on the other hand, well, the, their rules are divided up um, so that it does matter how you make the call. Are you making it via an automated telephone dialing system or via manual call? And it matters if you're calling a landline or if you're calling a wireless number. And so that's why we have this kind of dichotomy between the FTC and the FCC. 
um, also addressed back in 2008. Um, the FTC uh, decided that it was going to adopt a successive 30-day per campaign standard for call abandonment. Um, and of course, uh, prior to that time, uh, you know there were differences between the FTC and the FCC and how they were how they were handling uh, the call abandonment uh, measurement rates. Going up to uh, January 2010, the FCC issued a notice of proposed rulemaking where it started by saying, yes, okay, our pre-recorded rules are different than the FTC and we need to do something about it. And uh, if you look through the notice of proposed rulemaking, it was clear, you know, the FCC was kind of hamstrung by what I was talking about before. Um, its rules are not agnostic. It has to factor in this idea of um, automated calls versus manual calls, landline versus wireless. Um, but also the FCC did recognize uh, the, that there was an issue involving rolling versus successive abandonment rate measurements. That is, do you measure every 30 days per campaign on a, on a rolling basis? So that no matter where you go, no matter where in the campaign you look at a 30-day period, the, the abandonment measurement rate has to be at 3% or is it successive? And that means start at day one, go to day 30 measure then, and then go from day 31 to day 60 and measure there. Minor difference, but, you know, it, it, it would be nice if the FTC and the FCC got together on this. All right, so going on to the next page, let's, let's uh, break down the, uh, uh, the new FCC rule. All right, first, let's take a look at uh, predictive dialer and pre-recorded calls to cell phones. The old rule, Okay, you, you cannot make a predictive dialer call or a pre-recorded call to a cell phone without prior express consent. The new rule, okay, the, the FCC decided to create two categories. The first category are telemarketing calls, whether predictive dial or pre-recorded to cell phones. And then the second category is, uh, is a catch-all. It's all other predictive dialer pre-recorded calls to cell phones. Um, taking a look at category one. The new FCC rule divides these calls, the telemarketing calls, into uh, two categories, or actually three categories. Uh, calls that constitute telemarketing generally. These, just like with the Federal Trade Commission, now require prior express written consent. The second subcategory are telemarketing calls made by uh, tax-exempt nonprofit organizations. For these calls, no change uh, prior express consent. You don't have to have a writing is sufficient. Third category we're not even going to talk about today, and those are calls that are uh, made pursuant to uh, HIPAA. Um, and if anybody has any questions on that, I'm certainly free to address those uh, kind of offline. But I get the sense that uh, not too many people on this call, if anyone, are making calls related to, uh, to HIPAA. And then the second category is what I call a catch-all, and these are all predictive dial pre-recorded calls to cell phones other than the ones that are listed above. For these, you, you only have to get prior express consent, and the FCC kind of goes out of its way to, to make sure that people understand that informational non-telemarketing calls for, for research purposes, for surveys, fundraising, uh, political purposes, airline notifications, and debt collectors you only have to have that prior express consent. You do not need to get it in writing. Okay, and moving on, I believe uh, I'm just going to turn the, there we go, uh, turn the uh, phone over to, uh, to David. And David, uh, I certainly welcome the opportunity to hear more about uh, the work that you do. Great, great, thanks Joe. So. Uh, you know, when you're thinking about predictive dialing technology and compliance, uh, you know, consider uh, taking a look at 5.9. So 5.9 has been in the industry for over a decade, and uh, we've grown to be the market leader in cloud-based contact center software. Uh, so we have over 1,500 customers today using inbound, outbound, and blended capabilities. And over the years, we've partnered with a number of organizations like contact center compliance to help ensure that our customers can use our software in a compliant manner. So when you're looking at new predictive dialer technology uh, and considering different vendors of that technology, you know, take a look at some of the things that we have listed on the RAM side. You, know, you want to select someone that's established and proven uh, that has really you know, seen 
virtually anything that you can see in a contact center and when dealing with outbound calling and telemarketing. Uh, you want a vendor that does take compliance seriously, that's you know, familiar with the rules, and that's providing technology that allows you to configure the system to be compliant. Uh, so a good evidence of taking compliance seriously is if the vendor has a partner like contact center compliance and that the technology itself provides essential features. Some things that you would want to look for would include uh, the ability to regulate abandonment and, like Joe mentioned earlier, be able to uh, maintain that 3% uh, rolling or successive uh, period over 30 days. Uh, safe harbor, uh, the ability to leave a safe harbor message when there does happen to be an abandoned call. Uh, the ability to maintain a company DNC list for ad hoc requests to the, the folks that you're calling. If they would like not to be called by the company or for that campaign, you can add them to DNC lists. The ability to observe state regulations, as Ryan was mentioning earlier, those are also enforced. And it's important to configure rules around all of the regulations that each state has in place. Um, and then should uh, any action be taken by the FTC or FCC, we'd want to have the ability to provide, as Joe mentioned, rapidly uh, evidence of compliance. And you know, 5.9 provides robust reporting, the ability to provide custom reporting that can help ensure that you're monitoring and reporting on your compliance accurately. Uh, the ability to maintain records of different phone types so that you can distinguish between landlines and cell phones and so on. And then the ability to observe time of day rules so that you're, you're dialing during normal business hours and during the rules that are established in the, in the regulations. Uh, so those are just some of the things that you want to look for when considering either replacing your dialer technology uh, or looking for uh, new dialer technology in general. Uh, with that, I think we'll switch back over to Joe again so he can continue with uh, some of the additional rules around pre-recorded calls to residential lines. OK, great. Thank you, David. And as I mentioned before, the FCC has to address these issues um, from the perspective of you know the, the calling technology being used, and then where is the call being placed, wireless or uh, landline. So now we get to pre-recorded calls to residential lines. The old rule, um, and, and you know, this is very important, is that you, you have to get prior express consent if you want to deliver a pre-recorded telemarketing call to a residential line unless you have an established business relationship with the person that you're calling. If you, the, the old rule said that if you had an established business relationship, then you didn't have to get that prior express consent. Now, the FTC removed this exemption uh, going back to the ruling back in 2008, and also required consent in writing for all such calls. And now, um, three and a half, about three and a half years later, the FCC is following suit. So the new rule is that the FCC is following the Federal Trade Commission rule. If you're an entity that is not regulated by the FTC, but you are regulated by the FCC, you may no longer rely on an EBR to deliver a pre-recorded telemarketing message to a residential line. You have to obtain express written consent to make any such call. Um, however, the FCC does go to great lengths to explain that this only applies to telemarketing calls and not the informational non-telemarketing calls that I mentioned before, like research, survey, political, and debt collection. Um, also, uh, this rule does not apply to healthcare messages that are covered under HIPAA. So this is a, you know, obviously a big change, um, and uh, a lot of entities have to uh, uh, take this new rule into account. All right, so let's move on to the next slide, talking about uh, abandoned call changes. Um, the old rule under the FCC rules was that you measure your abandonment rate every 30 days across all calling campaigns. And this was very useful, uh, I believe, to the industry because it gave a, a lot of leeway for people when they were coming up with their abandonment rate. Um, you could have some campaigns that were running uh, at a higher abandonment rate and bigger campaigns that are running at a lower rate and average them all out, you get the 
obviously the FTC required measurement on a 30-day successive day basis per campaign, and that's a big difference. Now uh, the FTC and the FCC have finally gotten together and um, both agencies require measure, measuring abandonment rate on a 30-day successive day basis per campaign. And the only difference is um, that uh, under the FCC rule, uh, you, there are certain disclosures that you have to make in the context of the abandoned call. Um, under the FCC rule, uh, they say that you have to disclose that the call was for, quote, telemarketing purposes, along with the name and telephone number of the seller. And it's just interesting that the FCC put telemarketing purposes into quotes. It's an open question whether you have to use these specific magic words in your abandoned call disclosure. Um, that's up to uh, uh, individual entities uh, upon advice of counsel, of course, whether you want to go ahead and do that. And thank you very much, Ryan, for drawing an underline underneath that. So let's uh, move on to the next slide. Okay. Now, automated opt-outs when it comes to uh, uh, pre-recorded calls. The FTC says that uh, any uh, pre-recorded telemarketing call, and apologies, I missed uh, uh, the, the PR on this slide stands for pre-recorded, and PM stands for telemarketing, just in case anybody's wondering what it is I'm talking about here. Um, pre-recorded telemarketing calls that, quote, could be answered by a person have to have the interactive voice or key press opt-out. And then pre-recorded telemarketing calls that, quote, could be answered by an answering machine require a toll-free number disclosure. Now, as I and other attorneys pointed out at the time that the FTC issued this rule back in 2008, there's no way to know going into a phone call whether it's going to be answered by a person or whether it's going to be answered by an answering machine. So, in essence, the FTC requires um, an interactive voice or key press opt-out and you have to have a toll-free number disclosure, and this is just in all pre-recorded telemarketing calls. And the FCC rule is exactly the same um, as the FTC rule, but um, first of all, the FCC requires an opt-out during the abandoned call message. So you're setting off the abandoned call, and as part of that call, you, should, you, uh, you need to advise the called person um, if you don't want to receive any more telephone calls from us, uh, please press 1 and we'll put you on our internal do not call list. And then secondly, uh, the FCC has better language than the FTC. Um, they, they don't use this uh, could be answered language. Um, they say that a toll-free number disclosure must be made in any pre-recorded telemarketing message that are, that are in fact left on answering machines. So you're given the opportunity um, to uh, wait until uh, you've identified the fact that the call is going to an answering machine, and only under those circumstances do you have to make the toll-free number disclosure. Whether this is actually uh, a difference of import to the industry, I'm actually not sure. Um, I think, uh, based on my experience, uh, most telemarketers just opt to have the uh, opt-out and also to make the toll-free number disclosure as part of their abandoned calls. It's just easier that way and you don't have to worry about dividing up between uh, a live person and an answering machine. Hey Joe, a couple All of right, questions. All right, so let's move on. A couple of quick next questions. Question. Yep, sorry, go ahead. Let's answer a couple of quick questions about the uh, this particular rule because it popped up here. Um, is, this the, is an abandoned call the same as a dropped call? Yeah, a abandoned call is the same as a dead air call. If you're using a predictive dialer, um, there's going to be some phone calls where a phone call gets made to a person and the person picks up the phone and says hello and they get uh, what used to be dead air. That is a complete dropped call. Uh, there is no uh, individual available uh, to take that phone call. And under those circumstances, uh, the, the FTC determined uh, uh, back in 2008 um, we don't want to have dead air calls anymore. So under that circumstance, you have to deliver an abandoned call message. So in theory, uh, consumers should never be in a position where they pick up the phone and go, hello, hello, and hear nothing. Um, they're either going to get a live telephone sales rep or they're going to get the abandoned call pre-recorded message. And is that the same penalty 
they were talking about before the sixteen thousand per call, or how do, how do they enforce that? Um, yeah, you know, any uh, any violation of uh, the Federal Trade Commission rule or the FCC rule, um, they both have the language of a sixteen thousand dollar per fine. Uh, I'm sorry, per violation fine. And just keep in mind, I, I'm sure everybody's aware of if uh, an individual person decided to take you to small claims court, they can sue you under the TCPA for $500 and up to $1,500 in treble damages. Everyone's familiar with that. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the FCC also has the ability, um, if they wanted to, to enforce their rules, and they have the same $16,000 fine that the FTC has in place. All right. Okay. Let's let's move on to implementation. Well, that's a big word. It is, and uh, it's not just a big word. It's a very, very important issue here um, when it comes to these new FCC rules. You know, a lot of people um, are impacted by what the FCC has done here, and rightly so. They're very concerned to find out. All right, when exactly are do these rules take a, uh, take place? Uh, take effect? And the first step uh, in order for these rules to take effect is that the Office of Management and Budget has to approve these rules um, under various measures, uh, including the Paperwork Reduction Act. Um, so Office of Management and Budget needs to look at the new rule and say, OK, fiscally, it's sound. It makes sense. It's not putting uh, too much burden onto government. It's not putting too much burden onto uh, private enterprise. and um, I'll, I'll just start with this point. Uh, the OMB, uh, they have a website where you can go and you can check um, what uh, federal uh, enactments, legislative enactments, and regulatory enactments are under review. Uh, and the last time I checked, which was uh, just yesterday, uh, this, th this new FCC report and order is not under review as of yet. So the first step is the OMB has to put it under review. Then they have to approve it. And then from the point the OMB approves the new rule, you have a 30-day period to implement the new abandoned call rule. Uh, you have a 90-day period to implement the opt-out mechanism for pre-recorded telemarketing calls and abandoned call messages. And then, and this is a big one, you have a full year to phase out the EBR exemption for pre-recorded telemarketing calls to residential lines. And similarly, you have a full year for implementing the rule that you have to have prior express consent, and it has to be in writing for predicted dialer calls to cell phones. That, of course, the last one, that's the, that's the big one that uh, uh, the majority of the industry is concerned about. And the, you know, the silver lining here is that, first, we have to wait for OMB approval. And second, there's a full year before uh, that rule has to be implemented. Um, so as of right now, if you're making uh, predicted dialer calls to cell phones, you can still rely on express consent, and for the foreseeable future, at least for the next year, you can continue to rely on prior express consent, and consent does not have to be in writing. All right. Everybody got um, those timelines down? So, I'm sorry. Say that again, Ryan. I hope everybody got the timelines down because uh, it sounds like we're yeah, still it's very, meeting. It's very important. And, and, you know, I just I just wanted to address that. Um, it. it very often, you know, they're, they're, Ryan, you and I, and, and David, we've all seen the rumors that uh, develop with regard to uh, new proposed enactments coming from uh, federal and state agencies. And very often, uh, just the mere proposal uh, becomes, uh, if people start asking us, oh my god, there's this new law out there, aren't you guys aware of it? And normally, it, it turns out to be just a proposal that was made, or maybe a bill that was introduced. Um, here, I think a lot of people um, are very concerned uh, with regard to the new uh, FCC requirements. Um, but the one thing that people don't talk about is the implementation. The assumption that's made out there is that, well, once the rule is passed, it, it must be effective. But that is definitely not the case here. Well, since it's not been published, the question I've got on this webinar and the last one we did was, can this um, law be repealed. And I'm not, I, it's been a long time since I took my, my civics class in high school, so I'll leave yeah. that to you. Um, the, boy, the, the quick answer is uh, don't hold your breath. 
that this law is going to be repealed. Uh, I absolutely do not. I I don't anticipate that there are going to be any major changes to it. I know that uh, uh, PACE, formerly the ATA, uh, has submitted some additional comments to the FCC uh, in an attempt to fine tune some elements of the new rule. It's possible that there might be some uh, some fine tuning that that takes place. Um, but you know, the FCC. Uh, this is not a law. This is a regulation. The FCC has issued these regulations in response to a law, which is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act that was passed back in 1991. Um, and the the chance that Congress is going to, you know, amend the Telephone Consumer Protection Act at this point, uh, you know, specifically to make it possible that you can send off predictive dialer calls to cell phones with only prior express consent, I just don't see it happening. Yeah, and I mean, you've already seen a proliferation of, of cases that are, that are filed under TCPA for texting without consent. Uh, Microsoft is in a big one right now that I just posted something on our LinkedIn group, too. So, I mean, it's, I think this just opens the door for more cases. Um, yep, I absolutely agree. And, you know, it's interesting that, um, uh, that the new language has been put out uh, by the FCC. It, it's not it's not really addressing texting or SMS messages and uh, this whole new world of how people are communicating. Um, but you know any any communication that you're sending off to a cell phone is of course potentially going to be covered under uh, the the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. And I've yet to see anything uh, from the FCC uh, where they indicate that they, they see any difference uh, whether you're sending off a call to a cell phone or a text or a a video or a picture or whatever. Um, there's nothing to indicate that they're going to treat them differently. And what I what I found out when I was trying to research this company, they called me on my cell phone. You know, I just googled their caller ID number. It was it was you know obviously a legal robocall. The, some of the things I came across initially were right away people pointing out that hey, automated calls to your cell phone are illegal. If you want to sue, here's how you do it. Here's how you file a complaint, here's the information you need. I mean, there's even apps on your, you can get an iPhone or uh, with the, the Android platform that will let you file complaints right from your cell phone. I think somebody's called uh, Privacy as a star. And it's just, it, it's become much easier to get on the radar um, with, with the regulators and um, I think yeah, and, and right, right, going right, up. Good point. Uh, certainly with regard to pre-recorded telephone calls, um, the populace is primed to take action with regard to pre-recorded calls. Um, but, you know, at the same time, uh, pre-recorded calling technology is not a bad thing. It's actually a boom to consumers. Why? Because if you're, if you're uh, taking a flight and your flight gets delayed, guess what? You're now uh, informed on your cell phone and on your landline that the flight's been delayed. I mean, that, that, that's incredible. That's uh, very, very useful information. Um, and similar pieces of information are just as useful across all sorts of different scenarios. Um, yeah, we just had that, we had. I think that, sorry, I was go ahead. Say we we had the uh, last week. I think it was we had the Chevron fire down in Richmond. They used the reverse nine one one system to tell everybody close your doors, put towels under you know things so you don't uh, get the gas gassing smoke in your house and that kind of stuff. So I mean, it's it's not bad technology. It's just that you get people that don't scrub, they don't follow the rules, and they want to make a quick buck, and they figure out, you know, I'll just put my, my, my call center offshore, run a bunch of calls, collect the leads, change my company name when it's all done. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, F FTC is pretty keen on figuring out how all that works, so. Yep, as our state AGs, so. <clears throat> I, I guess the bottom line is when it comes to, uh, as I've said on many an occasion, uh, there's nothing more complex than the rules governing pre-recorded calls uh, in the United States, because here, we're, all we're talking about here are um, the FCC and the FTC, but you also have 50 states, and they all have different rules governing uh, what you need to do and what hoops you have to jump through and what you're prohibited in doing when it comes to pre-recorded calls across the entire spectrum. If you're making telemarketing calls or survey calls or polling calls or uh, political message calls of any sort, um, the rules are kind of complex and arcane, and, uh, you know, I certainly advise uh, seeking out advice of competent counsel if you're starting a pre-recorded calling campaign. All right. Let's move to.
to your uh, section on inbound calls. Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we put this in here just because, um, Ryan, you and I, we both run across a lot of people who just who just feel that inbound calls are, are not regulated at all, um, that they don't need to worry about state and federal rules when it comes to inbound calls. And um, maybe they treat it as a bit of the Wild West out there, and, and they're not uh, under any sort of, they're not concerned uh, that something could potentially happen to them. Uh, and the fact is, first of all, uh, state telemarketer registration rules. Um, there's a myth out there that if all you're doing is accepting inbound calls, you don't have to worry about the commercial registration rules. The fact of the matter is 33 states require registration by telemarketers, and 25 of these states apply their commercial registration rules to inbound calls. Of course, many exemptions apply, and uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of inbound calls out there, uh, calling programs that are not registered that should, under the rules, be registered. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Contact Center Compliance has an excellent tool uh, in its compliance guide, the, uh, the, the registration guide, uh, where you go in and you answer a series of questions. I think the whole process can take as little as 10, 15 minutes. Um, it used to take me to conduct a regulatory uh, registration review. Normally it took me about 10 hours on behalf of a particular client. Um, with this new tool that Contact Center Compliance has, it only takes about 10, 15 minutes, and you get a report with regard to what states you are supposed to register in. And of course, um, the registration guide has uh, includes outbound and inbound call uh, campaigns uh, in its analysis. And the, uh, the second myth that I just want to say is that uh, uh, the Federal Trade Commission's telemarketing sales rule does not apply to inbound calls. The fact is, specifically, um, the the uh, telemarketing sales rule says that it may cover certain inbound calls based on the type of offer that's being made. Uh, for example, investment opportunities, or if you send off a direct mail piece that doesn't contain sufficient disclosures, that falls directly under the TSR. Um, the TSR may cover uh, inbound calls based on you know how the calls are how the calls are generated. As I just mentioned, uh, the direct mail piece that goes out to people. Um, the telemarketing sales rule covers upsell. So even if you get an inbound call, the FTC says that if you're doing a, an additional upsell off of that inbound call, it's as if you've hung up the phone and called that person back on an outbound call. That's how they treat it. And so you have to worry about identification disclosures and purchase disclosures for upsells. And then finally, no matter what happens, if you're conducting an inbound campaign, and you're engaging in unfair uh, or deceptive practices, well, the FTC can go after you under, uh, under its just standard uh, Federal Trade Commission uh, uh, rules. Uh, it has the ability to enforce against unfair and or deceptive practices. And if you're doing anything wrong, the FTC can and will go after you. And one of the other things that Joe alerted, alluded to is the, uh, the compliance guide. One of the things that that does is provides updates on legal changes and kind of keeps people in the know. And so we, like for example, we just did an alert this morning on the change in New York where it used to be you didn't see many changes to state registration programs. New York uh, removed an exemption that, that was commonly used and I think they did something else that was uh, a little unusual, right? Joe? Well, yeah, New York, New York, um, uh, basically said, all right, we're going to enact a rule that uh, follows what uh, exists at the federal level for pre-recorded calls. So New York now requires uh, a prior express written consent if you are making a pre-recorded telemarketing call. And then New York did this, you know, I guess esoteric kind of nuance thing, um, whereas before there was an exemption in the rule that said, uh, let's say that you're incorporated in another state of the union. Um, under the prior rule, um, you could just say, okay, well, I don't need to register in New York State because I'm already incorporated in Utah. And uh, a lot of telemarketers, uh, with my advice and with other people's advice, were hanging their hat on that exemption and simply not registering in the state of New York because they were either licensed or incorporated in another state. But the change that, uh, that was just made is to make it clear that um, that, that there's probably New York is going to implement some sort of notice requirement. That is, let's say you're incorporated in Utah, 
but you're calling into New York State, you're going to have to submit proof to the Secretary of State in New York that you are, in fact, a Utah corporation. Uh, and that's what you will be – so in other words, if you're, if you're hanging your hat on that exemption, you're going to need to prove it to New York that, in fact, you, you are entitled to that exemption. More paperwork. Yep, just more paperwork. You know, that's, uh, that's how it is. But uh, I'm sure, you know, New York clued into the fact that there was a tremendous amount of telemarketing activity occurring in New York, and they didn't know who was doing it. You know, they had no, they had nothing on file with regard to the entities that were calling in uh, uh, New York State consumers. And, and that's kind of one of the ways that a state will locate a company, right? If in case of a violation, that's sure, absolutely. one of the reasons I mean, why they have a registration program, right? That's what, that's what they want. Um, uh, they get complaints from consumers. Uh, the consumers will name names and name the company. And normally, uh, what a, the first thing a state will do is, is to say, all right, well, are they registered with the state? No, they're not. All right, well, we, we, we may have them right on that point, just on that point alone. And then depending upon the egregiousness of the, uh, the claims made by the consumer, uh, that state AG's office might decide to say, all right, we're going we're gonna to follow up with this. We're going to issue a civil investigative demand. And, you know, the rest can go in all sorts of bad directions. Yeah, we won't go down that path right now. but No, nah, we don't need to. Let's jump over to uh, pre preview dialing. And before we um, go through the material, I'm going to take a quick poll in terms of uh, – are cell phones subject to the FCC TCPA rules when using a preview dialer? So is a preview dialer basically going to get you in trouble if you call a cell phone number? Or does that give you a workaround? So I'm going to launch that poll. It's either a yes or no. It shouldn't take too long. Let's see what people get here. This is a very debated topic. Mm -hmm. And results are pretty clear. We got 80% people said yes. The 20% are about saying no. It is All not right. subject. So I'll let you give your, your analysis, Joe. We'll, we'll find out what the real answer is. Inquiring well, yeah, and, 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 you know, uh, in the absence of a pronouncement from the uh, the FCC on this matter, there there is no final answer, and it all just comes down to um, working with your uh, counsel and uh, taking a look at your the level of risk that is is acceptable to you. Um, maybe we the, should the, the, uh, maybe we should explain what a preview what the difference between a preview dialer and a predictive dialer is. David, you want to maybe? Sure. Oh yeah, give us give us a, a, a an expert opinion on this. The sure. difference so between the two dialer, you have the automatic ability to dial um, many numbers in succession and even simultaneously, uh, automatically. And with preview dialing, uh, typically a system will deliver individual uh, contact records to the person making the phone calls, and then that person has to manually uh, click a button to uh, place that outbound call to a specific. Uh, contact and to a specific phone number and um, listen to the dial progress as that call is being, being made. Excellent. Thank you, David. And of course, the, you know, the key issue here is if, um, for, if you're calling up cell phone numbers um, and you want to avoid being covered by the FCC rules, uh, well, then you uh, can use manual dialing, which everyone associates with picking up a uh, uh, the headset and uh, dialing a number and just waiting for the phone to ring and then talking to the person. Um, the alternative is uh, to use a predictive dialer, uh, which uh, the FCC, going back to 2003, they decided that a, pred a predictive dialer is an automated telephone dialing system, even though the language, in my opinion, doesn't make it an automated telephone dialing system, but that, uh, that ship has sailed. Um, but then you have this, uh, this thing in the middle, preview dialing. Does that fall into the manual dialing camp, or does it fall into the predictive dialing camp? And at uh, you know, in uh, the the consideration here is whether or not the FCC uh, is going to uh, enforce its rules against your preview dialing campaign. 
in, in my mind, uh, looking at FCC pronouncement, I believe uh, a very good case can be made that preview dialing falls into the manual dialing camp. Now again, reasonable minds can disagree uh, with me on this, but uh, in 2003, uh, the FCC determined that any equipment that has the capacity to dial numbers without human intervention, and two, that can dial thousands of numbers in a short period of time is an automated telephone dialing system. And for me, well, preview mode requires human intervention. And secondly, preview mode has no abandoned calls. It's one-to-one -one calling. That is, one person is pressing a button, and that one person dials a number, and that goes to one person out there, some consumer. So, our, so uh, there, there are no thousands of numbers being called in a short period of time uh, by some automated system. Um, and again, this, this comes down to uh, a particular entity and the level of risk uh, that they're willing to take on. Um, but uh, uh, this is kind of a it's, a, it's an evergreen topic uh, for me and the other attorneys in this space because, uh, yeah, we do uh, disagree with regard to uh, this issue. Uh, but I have come down on the side of, well, I guess the minority of people on this phone call, uh, I've come down on the side to say the preview dialing, I put in the manual dialing context unless and until the FCC decides to say something uh, def definitive with regard to this topic. Cool. All right. Let's move what on what to uh, public safety do not call list, eh, which was a... I think that's, that's old news. Um, you want to just go on to uh, issue 10? Yeah, I mean, basically what's going to happen is there's a public safety DNC list that someday is supposed to take form. A lot of debate about it. You can read about it on the um, uh, FTC, FCC, I'm sorry, uh, their site, and they got hearings, and they're trying to figure it out. Basically, it's a list of uh, public safety numbers that they want to get out of rotation and prevent people from calling, but they can't figure out how to get that released and the privacy and all the numbers and all that. So, yeah, it's it's just interesting that um, the there are already rules in place that say that you know you're not you're not supposed to be calling emergency numbers uh, in the first place. Um, and then for me, the big consideration is uh, does it really make sense to wide, widely disseminate a list of all the emergency numbers in the United States? You know, given uh, what we know about uh, the state of the world today, um, and I, I have to believe that uh, you know more logical, reasonable heads will prevail on this issue, um, and that uh, uh, the, the middle class tax relief and job creation act, which of course has nothing to do with setting up a, you know a, a do not call list for public safety entry points, um, that perhaps that will be amended and uh, they'll get rid of this requirement that the FCC has to create this do not call list. I, 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 eh, I don't know, you can, you can uh, spend a lot, your entire lifetime waiting for reasonable measures from our elected officials, but um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that, uh, uh, that this is not going to move forward. And I mean, I get questions from people that want to scrub out these kinds of numbers now. And it's not like you can go buy the list or go acquire the data really easily. I mean, there's no central database, so you, know, you do your best to do your scrubbing for DNC and for cell phones and your opt-outs and make sure your data is clean coming in. I mean, it's not like these numbers are, are readily available or right, you know, right, right. Exactly. They're, 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 they're not going to show up on a, a list of consumers. You know, it just yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. So let's let's round out the top ten issues with issue number ten: enforcement trends. Okay, some uh, enforcement trends. Okay, a few rules to live by with regard to bill collecting. And keep in mind, um, the FTC and, and state AGs, they're, they're very interested in making sure that consumers who are having tough times economically are protected. Um, there are uh, some entities out there who are taking advantage of people, taking advantage of the fact that uh, they're having economic distress and uh, you know, figure out ways to extract yet further money, uh, thus exacerbating their economic distress. Um, but a couple of, based upon enforcement uh, uh, actions that we have seen, uh, when it comes to bill collecting, uh, just 
do make sure that people actually owe money before you call them. Uh, don't pretend that you're with law enforcement before you make the call or while you're making the phone call. And don't uh, threaten to take away a consumer's children if they don't pay a debt. Um, this was a specific case uh, that the FTC enforced and you know, one of the more egregious problems associated with what this company was doing, uh, they identified one instance where uh, one of the representatives actually threatened to take away a consumer's children. So that is, uh, shall we say, frowned upon. Um, business opportunities. Uh, if uh, you are uh, either an entity offering uh, home-based business opportunities, uh, or if you are uh, a call center making calls on behalf of uh, home-based business opportunities, I think you need to be very much aware of the fact that um, at the federal level and at the state level, um, there's a, a, a very strong enforcement commitment um, to go after entities that are offering uh, what they call biz ops, business opportunities. Um, the FTC passed a new business opportunity rule. Uh, Arizona just passed a very, very restrictive business opportunity rule. Um, so to the extent that you are offering people uh, the, the ability to start their own business and to, you know, the whole idea of starting a business is that you're going to make money off it, um, you need to be very careful in what you do. And it's very possible that you, that you need to register um, your program with uh, at least a few states across the United States because they have a rule in place that says, okay, if you're going to call up our consumers and offer a, a business opportunity, we need to know about it ahead of time. So uh, just uh, keep that in mind. Um, don't take advantage of people in financial uh, uh, distress. Stay away from uh, uh, small short-term loans and also stay away from not revealing the fact that there are high cost fees and interest rates associated with small short-term loans. Um, also look out for programs uh, charging up front for lowering car payments. Um, a lot of people owe a lot of money on, uh, with, uh, for their cars and there are certain programs out there where people say, all right, you know, uh, pay us $500 and we'll figure out a way for you to lower your car payments. Um, that's a that's going to get you uh, some uh, regulatory heat. Um, some very general thoughts. Um, if you settle with the FTC and you enter into an assurance of voluntary discontinuance of some sort, don't turn around and just start up another company that's doing the same thing and assume that you're not going to get caught. Chances are you are going to get caught. Um, always abide by the terms of your privacy policy. Um, whenever you receive a request from a state or federal regulator, Take it seriously. Respond to it. Um, you know, just do your due diligence and get the information together and cooperate uh, and give them the information that they want. Um, the worst thing that can be done is you just ignore a request from a state or federal regulator. That's uh, a sure way to get that request bumped up to a, a true investigation where you get a civil investigative demand and you're, you know, possibly uh, deposed and put on the record and. Uh, that can just be enormously disruptive. And then finally, and, and this was a case I, I forget, I forget which case it was, I forget the name of it, um, but don't claim uh, uh, that an affiliation with an, uh, with an Indian tribe, don't think that that makes you exempt from the FTC rules. There actually was a company out there that uh, was somehow affiliated with an Indian tribe and they made the, the case to the Federal Trade Commission that, well, you know, this is an Indian tribe and they don't fall under the jurisdiction of the federal government or the state governments for that matter. And uh, the FTC had none of it and uh, ended up hitting that person with a fine. So these are reasonably obvious things and some of them are kind of humorous, but uh, I just wanted to put together an overview of recent enforcement trends involving the Federal Trade Commission. Cool. Let's, uh, that was a good, good summary of things to kind of watch out for. Got a couple quick minutes before we kind of need to wrap things up because we're already kind of running over. Mm -hmm. um, before we do a couple questions, just a couple things for people on the phone today. A um, couple special offers. First one is, if you want to run a small database or a sample with us to figure out well, how many how many cell phone numbers do we have on our files that we need to maybe go out and ask for permission on, or how's this rule going to affect us? Happy to do that for folks on the call. Uh, we also have a free compliance kind of safe harbor report that people can go through. I'm going to I'll send that out with the slides that people can click through. It'll kind of explain 
um, what they need to be tracking for as part of our compliance guide. It's a really nice way to kind of get a big picture on compliance and make sure you're doing all the right things. Um, and like I said, we'll have the slides out to people probably later today, tomorrow. Um, as soon as I get the, the recording on our site, it will stream and it looks like the recording is uh, hung on there. We didn't have the audio problems that we had a couple a month or so ago, so that's been nice. A um, couple quick questions and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Uh, the first one is on, we always get this question, it's, you know, well, I'm mainly doing B2B, how, does, how do these rules kind of apply to me? I'm not really doing so much B2C. I don't know if you want to take right. a shot at that one, yeah, Joe. Quick, quick, quick answer, uh, these rules are not going to apply um, to a B2B campaign. Uh, but of course, be on the lookout for you know any calls that you're making um, uh, to a cell phone. It doesn't matter if it's a, a cell phone that's registered to a business or whatever. Um, it still uh, is considered a cell phone for for purposes of those FCC rules. Um, but just generally speaking, um, the the focus of the regulators and the enforcers with regard to telemarketing issues is, of course, in the B two C environment. Um, there's a little bit of crossover when you have situations where people hold out um, a, a home number, a residential number as their business number, and perhaps you make a phone call to that number. Um, it's hard to really address that uh, in, any, uh, in any real way. Um, and quite frankly, uh, in terms of enforcement actions out there, I really haven't seen um, any situation where, like the FTC went after a company that was doing a B2B campaign and ended up, uh, you know, uh, finding them because they called some uh, actual home numbers or residential lines as opposed to business lines. That's my kind of quick overview answer to that question. Uh, that's the same kind of answer I usually give people is, you know, even if it's B2B, you've got a dialer involved, probably not a bad idea to scrub cell phones out or at least mm -hmm put them into preview or manual campaign so that you don't get, you know, one of these people that just wants to file a, a case against you under TCPA. Um, let's see. How much dead air is acceptable before playing the dropped call message? Um, you, you have to play the, the drop call message within three seconds of the, the called person's completed greeting. So you have uh, a little bit of time uh, before the uh, before you have to play that uh, uh, the the pre-recorded abandoned call message, um, or is it two seconds? Oh my God, I can't! I I, I haven't even quoted that number in a long time. I think it's uh, uh, two seconds of the called person's completed greeting. That was three. That's two seconds. Okay, two seconds. Okay, good. That's what I thought. Um, uh, so that's how long you have. You know, there, there, it's, uh, you don't have a great deal of time uh, in order to work out uh, uh, delivering that abandoned call message to people. Let's take one last one. This is a good one uh, in terms of obtaining express consent or express written consent. Can, can it be built into a terms of conditions of the website? Can you mail it out to a customer? Uh, what would be allowable for the purposes of... Uh, getting express consent to comply with these new FCC. Yeah, I, I, I'm just going to um, say that, uh, that, that there's, no, there's no just quick answer to that question. Um, it, it really is on a campaign by campaign basis. Um, the general idea is that uh, the more you're hiding uh, the consent that people are giving, the more that it's buried in terms and conditions the less likely it is that you're going to be able to convince the Federal Trade Commission that it truly counts as express written consent. Um, and the more upfront you are with regard to uh, disclosures uh, for this express written consent, for example, uh, if you have a website and you have a checkbox and next to the checkbox it says by checking this box I'm signing this form and giving my consent to receive telephone calls on my landline and on my, uh, my uh, cell phone number that I've included on this form you know, that's good. That's going to work for you. Um, a lot of people uh, feel that a, a checkbox, uh, some people call it a death box, and uh, they try to figure out ways of getting around it. That's where you need to rely upon advice of counsel. That's where you need to, you know, get a gauge of where you're at when it comes to uh, risk averse, risk aversion, and, uh, you know, make a judgment call as to how far you want to take, um, how far you want to go into the gray as opposed to just staying in the black. Okay, Ryan? 
Yeah, I think we're good. We'll probably be putting on another webinar specifically um, end of September, I think is probably what I'm looking at my calendar. Trying to do these a little more frequently. We used to do them a little more on the quarterly basis, but things are changing. Temperatures kind of heating up. Um, and so look for that in another email. And then, uh, like I said, we've got a LinkedIn group, the Contact Center Compliance Officers Forum. Great place to kind of track with uh, the changes, stay updated on everything. And, uh, certainly look forward to talk to people after the call if they've got other questions or interested in any of our respective uh, expertise. Appreciate Joe and David for uh, joining us today. I think the presentation went extremely well, and uh, I think some people are going to really get their questions answered. So we give ourselves a virtual pat on the back. Excellent. All right. Thank uh, you, Ryan. Thank you, Dave. Right on. Thanks, Ryan. We have a good day. Okay. Bye-bye.